Good evening. Thank you. Good evening. <laughs> For those who don't know me, um, my name is Sister Kathy Duffy, and I direct the um, Institute for Religion and Science here at Chestnut Hill College. Um, this is, this uh, institute is a regional center for exploring science and spirituality, and we're so happy that you all could come and join us this evening. Um, I'd like to welcome you to the, our Sugarloaf campus. This is our uh, latest uh, addition to our campus here uh, at Chestnut Hill and to this evening's lecture. As many of you know, the Institute aims to promote the constructive engagement of religion and spirituality with science and technology, to encourage dialogue in these areas that is interfaith, multi-science, and civil, we sponsor lectures, a reading circle, and a variety of other events. So do check our website for a growing number of videos, too, of our past lectures. Almost all of our past lectures are on the, on the website. You can uh, view them through the, you know, our YouTube channel. And uh, so if you've missed anything, be good to look through them and find something that would interest you. And if you aren't on our mailing list, if you didn't get an email from us, from the Institute, then you should sign up on our mailing list so that you can be aware of the coming events. So uh, I'm going to ask um, Dr. Peter Dodson, one of our advisory committee members, to introduce our speaker. We're so happy to have Marissa man uh, um, march with us this evening. And so uh, Peter will tell you a few, give you a few words about Marissa. Thank you. Thank you, Kathy. Good evening, everybody. <clears throat> Uh, it gives me great delight to introduce to you our speaker tonight, who is a very dear friend of mine, uh, Dr. Marissa Marsh, who is a cosmologist at the University of Pennsylvania, where she carries out research in the field of dark energy science, a field that seeks to understand the acceleration of the universe. Dr. Marsh has worked on galaxy lensing for, future, for the future Euclid space mission, and she now works on supernova cosmology for the ground-based Dark Energy Survey. Uh, Dr. Marsh is a faculty fellow at the Collegium Institute for Catholic Thought and Culture at the University of Pennsylvania, where she is a director of the Magi, Magi Project for Science and Theology. She is also a senior fellow for the Program for Research on Religion and Urban Civil Society. Dr. Marsh studied theoretical physics at Imperial College London where she uh, carried out her doctoral research on advanced statistical methods for astrophysical probes of cosmology. I think this means she's a smart person, all of this. All of this. She frightens me a little bit. <laughs> she also holds, holds a bachelor's degree in Catholic theology from Haythrop College in London. Dr. March. Well, thank you, Dr. Dodson, and thank you, Dr. Duffy, for that fantastic, well, that fantastic introduction. And thank you very much for welcoming me here tonight, and thanks to all of you for coming to listen to my story, to listen to what I'm going to say to you. As you've gathered, I am British. I'm from the north of England. I speak very quickly, and I have a funny northern accent. So if you can't hear me, especially at the back, I'm talking too fast, you have to make yourself known, OK? So what does it mean to be a scientist and to be a Christian? And how can we make sense of these two seemingly different paths in life? Life in Christ and life in the lab. To many, to many people, these two ways of life don't fit together well. I was down at our telescope back in January, and I met another cosmologist there. We were sitting at lunchtime, and he said, what are you doing here? You're like a unicorn. People like you don't exist. <laughs> for, for him, talking to somebody who is an astronomer or a cosmologist and also a believer in Christ was like talking to some kind of mythical animal that didn't really exist. So tonight, I'm going to reflect on this mythical existence, uh, on my life as a scientist and my life as a Christian, as a follower of Christ. 
And along the way, I'm going to begin by telling you a bit of, of my personal story about how my, my realization of my vocation, both as a scientist and as a Christian. Then I'm going to talk about some of the more academic side of that relationship between science and religion in the context of our, our work and our vocation. And finally, if we have time, I'm going to offer a few thoughts on our own contemplation and reflection of the cosmos and how that can fit in with our, with our own faith. So, as a scientist who believes in God, we stand in a privileged position. We stand at the meeting point between two worlds. We can stretch out our hands and touch both the spiritual and the physical. We're standing on a kind of bridge between these two different worlds. And on the one hand, in our daily life, in our work, we can experience the physical. All those things that we touch, that we measure, we observe, um, that we do our experiments with. And on the other side, we also have our supernatural or spiritual life. We have our life of prayer. We have the sacraments. We have our religious beliefs. And sometimes it can seem quite bewildering. We can sometimes feel that our spiritual or believing friends are worried or intimidated by our scientific work. And then sometimes our scientific colleagues can feel like our spiritual beliefs, our religious practices are a bit sort of strange and somehow apart from who we really are. But you can be both. And what is it that we can bring to the, to the discussion as both people who are both believers in Christ and believers in modern scientists, in, in modern science, that we can work in this world of technology, that we can follow our pathway in, in research and all kinds of physics, and yet still believe in God who created the universe? And I know this is a question close to the hearts of all of us. And there are many different kind of angles or ideas that we're going to discuss, but mainly tonight I'm going to focus on my own experiences in this kind of funny place, this kind of meeting point between two worlds. And I'm also going to focus on some of the writings from Pope John Paul II. So there's a document called Christi Videlis Laisi, which warns us against the temptation of legitimizing an unwarranted separation between our life of faith and our secular dealings in the world. And that is a temptation to put these things apart and keep our church things in one box and our other life in the other box. And never the two things are gonna meet. And I used to suffer from this temptation a lot. And in fact, I fell into, the, I fell into this kind of big temptation in my life, most of my life, until I was about 25, 30-ish. So I'm gonna tell you a bit about my story and as, as Peter mentioned, I studied here at Imperial College London. Uh, we have this very nice kind of Queen's Tower and Queen's Lawn. I studied physics and I studied theoretical physics and I went on to do my PhD here. I had great friends. I really enjoyed my time there. I worked in a lab like this some of the time. So I had my kind of normal day-to-day -day life as a physicist. I had good friends, um, you know, always running down the street late trying to hand in my lab report on time all that kind of stuff. And at the same time, right next door was a big church called Brompton Oratory. And this is where I used to go to mass. And I come from a small village in the middle of nowhere. So going to a kind of mass like this, it's all kind of solemn and Latin and incense. It was quite a surprise for me. And I felt quite bowled over by it. But I found it, I felt strangely attracted to it. And I was going to mass more often, I was praying more often. And I was making friends there. And I went to visit a monastery. So these very nice Benedictine nuns. And when I met the nuns, I felt like, gosh, these nuns, they really know something important. They have a kind of depth of spirituality. They're touching a reality, which is something beyond what I can see in the lab. And I felt really inspired by this. But the interesting thing is that in all this, my friends in college, I kept separate from all my kind of friends in church. Like I had my church friends and I had my physics friends. And they never met. Like they kind of knew, yeah, okay, she does this stuff on a Sunday, or yeah, she's in the lab. But they weren't really mixing. They were quite separate, separate, separate realms of my life, really. Anyway, I graduated from college, and I went off, and I did my, actually, I did theology studies first, and I ended up being a teacher in England in a high school. That was quite an experience in a big, uh, big public school. And then I ended up getting a postdoc position in the University of Sussex, and I started working for my favorite project called the Dark Energy Survey. This is our telescope down in Chile. 
This is me with one of my colleagues in front of the telescope. We're really proud of it. It's a um, big telescope, and the top is the dark energy camera. This is our control room and the Blanco dome. So I was working there, having a great time, and it's a beautiful place to be. So in the mountains at night time, you kind of see, um, you can really see this clearly. You can see the Milky Way. And the first time I saw these things, I thought, what's those funny kind of smudges, those kind of funny clouds in the sky? Like, oh, wait, it's the Large and Small Magellanic Cloud. OK, so these are kind of like dwarf galaxies nearby, which being from the Northern Hemisphere, I'd never seen before. So I was struck by this kind of sense of awe and wonder at being here in this place. And I think it's an experience common to many of us that when we look at something beautiful, either in the universe, in the night sky, or even in a laboratory, you know, if you're studying genetics or botany or some other discipline, you can see beauty in the created world. So I was having a good time. I was, you know, working as a physicist at this telescope a lot of the time and in Sussex. I had everything going for me. I had a good social life. I had nice friends in physics. I had nice friends in church. They didn't meet. And it was all going really, really well. But there was something in my heart that left me sort of dissatisfied. There was something that left me wanting something more. Like, I thought, yeah, this is great. And yeah, I'm Catholic. I'm Christian. I go to church and I pray. There was this really strong sense of, of longing for something more. And after a while, I really thought, gosh, I think God's calling me to some kind of consecrated life. So I started discerning formally with a community called the Marian Community of Reconciliation. I thought, wow, is this where God is calling me? And I remember they invited me to go and discern with them more fully down at their house in Lima. And they said to me, well, Marisa, why don't you just leave your job and come down and discern with us properly? I thought, you're kidding. That's crazy. You know. I've got a serious academic career. I can't possibly leave. People will think I'm crazy. I'll never work again in physics if I do that. Besides, I'll never work in physics again if I become a, a sister. So <laughs> I remember being at this telescope that, that, that winter and being in an absolute crisis of thinking, gosh, what am I going to do? And I, and I really prayed about it a lot, and I decided to do it. I said, well, I'm going to do this. I'm going to give it a try and see what happens. And then my perception was always like, oh, I can't tell my physics people about religion because they'll think I'm crazy. But I went to a big collaboration meeting that was held in Michigan. It was a dark energy survey collaboration meeting. And I went round and I spoke to all the different people in my collaboration. Out of the 300, I probably spoke to about 30 or 40 of them personally. And I said to them, oh, well, you know, by the way, I've made a decision. I'm going to be leaving academia. Oh, what are you doing? Well, I'm going off to discern my vocation. So are you doing what? Um, and you know, I had to really explain it to them. But I was overwhelmed at how supportive people were. I hadn't been expecting that. I was really expecting people to sort of look embarrassed and look away. But people really said to me, oh, gosh, Marisa, that's really great. I'm really impressed that you're following your path in life. Or they would tell me stories about, oh, well, my mum was a Nazareth house, and she was looked after by the sisters, and they really cared for her. And they tell me all these stories that they had that were a little bit related. So it really, that experience really inspired me to think that our faith and our, fit and our work shouldn't be separated. And actually, people are a lot more sympathetic than you might think to hearing about our religious beliefs, to being supportive of the fact that we have different ideas in life. So after I went to Lima, because this is where the kind of the order was based, I went off to Lima. I did a, a six-week course in Spanish. So um, I wasn't quite fluent by the time I got there. And it was quite a challenge. And Lima is a real city of contrast. So you can see that there's these very wealthy areas down here, the colonial areas, the old cathedral. And there's also these really, really poor areas on the mountains. And when I was there, I did a little bit of work in the, in the shanty towns. To be honest, most of my time in Lima, I was really, really learning how to speak Spanish. That was like a big, big challenge for me. But I spent a lot of time praying and, and thinking about these things and um, reflecting on the human poverty here really made me think about what does it mean to be human and what is our purpose in life? What is the vocation in life for these kids? And these kids are like ordinary, middle-class kids, you know, 
they like all the kind of things that you know kids over here like to but they're living in abject poverty they've got no fresh water there's no sewage system they're living in these horrible places it's really really a challenging life There are also very beautiful parts of, Lima, of Peru. This is up in the highlands in Juarez. And I had the good fortune to go up here to teach a little bit. And I ended up teaching in this school. Um, and these kids don't do science a lot, so we did this kind of experiment with science that they loved. I had to search the entirety of Lima to find the red cabbage, to do the classic red cabbage acid alkali experiment here, uh, which the kids thoroughly enjoyed. Um, and, and again, here's me with, with the class. But it was really a great experience to, to share my science with these kids and to talk about the dark energy and all kinds of things in my sort of not very good Spanish. Um, and, and, to, and to connect with them in a way that really, and all these experiences really made me question, you know, purpose, mission, vocation. And in the end, as you probably gathered, I came back from Lima because I wasn't really a very good fit for the order. And they said to me, well, look at me, so really sorry, but you're not really quite, quite right. So I'd spent a long time there discerning this. And sometimes people say to me, gosh, Marisa, do you regret going to Lima and giving up everything? And I say, no, it gave me tremendous freedom. I had this opportunity to really respond to what I perceived as being a call from God to go and try it out. And I've come back so much richer because of it, because I've now got to that point where I really ask these deep questions and I really seek meaning in life. You know, why are we here? Where are we going? And I'm doing physics. I'm back here doing physics, and I have to ask myself, why am I doing physics? How does that contribute to humanity? How does that tie in with my vocation? And for all of us here in this room, you know, what is your vocation in life? You know, where are you, where are you going? Why are you here? Um, what's the purpose and meaning of our life? So these are all really, really um, big, deep questions. And going on now to talk a bit more about these big questions, one of the key things that sets us apart from the animals is our ability to wonder at the universe. So we can look into the universe and contemplate the natural beauty. I can stand at the telescope and think about, wow, you know, what are, what is, what are all those stars in the sky, these kind of baby galaxies? Here's a, a fantastic picture that I love, and it's it's the planet Saturn, and this little kind of dot here with the arrow cunningly showing you, this is Earth. So here we are, looking back at Earth. This is taken on a Cassini mission. You might remember Carl Sagan in a Cosmos series, so the very first picture was taken with Voyager looking back, and Carl Sagan talks about this pale blue dot in the sky. He says, we're just a pale blue dot in someone else's sky. And the point is that you know, we look at this picture and we have big questions like, what is our place in the universe? Are we significant or insignificant? And actually, I'd like to share with you some comments from a document called the, well, it's the National Science Foundation 2010 Decad Decadal Review. And it's essentially the kind of white paper that sets out the research interests for the astrophysical community for the next 10 years. And we're anxiously anticipating the one that's coming out in two years' time. But I want to read you a quote from that document. And it says, the universe has always beckoned us. Over the course of human civilization, the night sky has provided a calendar for the farmer, a guide for the sailor, and a home for the gods. Astronomy led the scientific revolution, which continues to this day, and has revealed that the sky visible to the naked eye is really just a hint of the vast and complex cosmos within which our home planet is but a pale blue dot. That one there. Astronomers continue to explore the universe, learning its amazing history, discovering the riches of its contents, and understanding the physical processes that take place in its astoundingly diverse environments. Today, astronomy expands knowledge and understanding inspiring new generations to ask, how did the universe form and the first stars come into being? Is there life beyond Earth? What natural forces control our universal destiny? 
Because of the remarkable scientific progress in recent decades, in particular, the explosion over the last decade of interest in the urgency to understand several key areas in astronomy and astrophysics, scientists are now poised to address these and many other equally profound questions in substantive ways. The opportunities for the future fill us with, fill us with awe, enrich our culture, and frame our view of the human condition. Now for me, when I read that kind of comment in what's essentially a funding paper from the National Science Foundation, I'm pretty impressed. I mean, it's, for me, it's fascinating that a science funding document is talking in this language of, of awe. And it's really interesting that it's highlighting that we live in this era of exceptionally high technological pro progress, of high scientific progress. But also that these things prompt us to ask these deep and profound questions. Questions, and, and the, review, the review goes on to say this, it says, these questions have both scientific and philosophical implications. And they've spawned a multitude of fascinating questions about our origins that we're racing toward answering in the 21st century. So I've given you an example from astrophysics of the kind of sense of awe and wonder that we have, but you could have chosen any discipline. And the point is that even secular scientists who do not come from a religious background recognize that our study of science prompts us to ask these deep and meaningful questions. And it even says that the, quest the answers are not found within physics. Okay, physics is all about visible, observable, measurable, how big is it, how black is it, how white is it, how dark is it, how hot is it, how cold is it, all those questions. But there's other questions about meaning. You know, why are we here? What does it mean to be human? Oh, you know, what does it mean if we're not alone in the universe? These questions are not answered by physics. And in fact, I would argue that the questions are going to have their answer in philosophy, but even beyond that, they're going to have an answer in theology. They're going to have an answer in our faith, because we're a mixture of both a physical being and a spiritual being. Okay, we've, we're, we've got physical bodies, and we've also got immortal souls. That's how I was saying, you know, we're, we're standing on this bridge between two worlds. We say our prayers, we pray, we have a relationship with God, and at the same time, we live in a physical universe. And another reason that I really like this document and this quote is because it, it really reminds me of a, of a quote that begins another important document called Gaudium et Spes, okay, which is a, a document from the Church's Second Vatican Council. And it goes like this. It says, though mankind is stricken with wonder at its own discoveries and its power, it often raises anxious questions about the current trend of the world about the place and role of man in the universe, about the meaning of its individual and collective striving, about the ultimate destiny of reality and humanity. Again, Gaudium et Spes is really repeating those same questions that are written in the Decadal Review. And those two documents, you know, they're sort of 50, they're 50 years apart. One is a science document for funding, the other is a church document about dealing with the church in the modern world. So it's really interesting that both, both angles recognize these deep questions. And I think as we look around at our modern world with uh, smartphones and habitable exoplanets, space telescopes, and all these kind of things that are going on, and if you've been following um, the series Black Mirror we've been discussing earlier at dinner, these kind of ways that technology can take over your life and progress, it really um, makes us question how we use technology. And I'd say that in terms of science, there are really four kinds of questions that we're, we can ask. Yeah, so one kind of question is that first question, which are these abstract and profound questions about the origin, meaning, and purpose of life and the destiny of the universe. The next one is about the place and importance of humanity, especially given our seemingly insignificant geographical location with this pale blue dot in someone else's sky. And especially when we ask this question against the backdrop 
of the discoveries of habitable exoplanets. That means planets that we could potentially find life on or could be inhabited by some kind of life, an intelligent life at that, to what degree we don't know. The third question is more prosaic, it's about how we do science, but it's also about why we do science. Why do we spend money doing science and not on education or something different? And it asks, you know, how does science fit in with human society and the other endeavors that we have as humans? And the fourth question is also more practical, and it's about how we use technology. So what are our individual and collective responsibilities as scientists? Because we're the ones that are the kind of gatekeepers of science and technology, and how are we going to use this new science and technology in, in our lives and society? So I would say that ultimately these questions only make sense when we consider them from a fully human vantage point, which considers both the physical and the supernatural aspects of human nature. So as a, as a scientist as Christian, one of the fundamental things that distinguishes us from our secular colleagues is how we go about approaching those questions. Now, as a Catholic, I know that we can live integrated lives. This is not about compartmentalizing our kind of believing life and our religious life and having it separate from our you know, secular or working life. So, as we know that both faith and reason can play a role in lifting the human spirit to the contemplation of truth. That's a very famous quote from the document Fidei's at Ratio. And the problem is that the purely materialistic world only sees part of the truth. So going back to this document from Gaudium et Spes, it was written in the 1960s, and it was not written as a letter to the scientists. However, it says lots of helpful things about the church in the modern world, and with a particular emphasis on the role of the laity. That is, all the kind of ordinary Christians, okay, we're just kind of like ordinary Christians going about our daily lives, we're not ordained, we're not religious sisters, we're not monks, and a lot of that document is aimed at people who are just ordinary Christians going about in their lives. And the document is addressed to all the faith, all people. It's not just aimed at Christians or believers or people who have important jobs in the church. It's addressed to all of humanity and it offers the church's understanding on where to look for answers for these four questions that we've got up here. And actually, in Gaudium et Spes, it boldly asserts that only in Christ, our Lord and Master, can be found the key, the focal point, and the goal of man, as well as all human history. So that's a pretty profound statement that um, all human activity and endeavor has its end in humanity. But, all, but the, end of, the end of us, okay, the end of man or the end of woman, I'm using man in the, in the generic sense here, the end of humanity can only be understood in the light of Christ. And it's only in the light of Christ that we can understand the human race because we're made in his image and likeness. Beneath the ever-changing reality of, of scientific progress and change, there are also many realities that do not change, which have their ultimate foundation in Christ, who is the same yesterday, today, and yes, forever. Truth is a real thing. Truth really exists. Often we search for the, physical, the, the truth about the physical world, that's one kind of truth, but there's also another kind of truth, which is about the spiritual world. And these things don't change. So accepting that we can't compartmentalize our lives, our scientific work and our, and our faith, um, this is central to understanding our vocation as a scientist and as a Christian, or even as a non-scientist and as a Christian, living in this secular, technologically, you know, um, very busy, up-to-date world. And the key thing is that through baptism, all Christians have been baptized into the body of Christ. And because Christians have been baptized into the body of Christ, that also means they've been incorporated into the life of the Trinity. 
because Jesus is part of the Trinity. So as soon as someone's baptized, they become part of the body of Christ in whatever denomination, okay, all Christian denominations, and somehow they're incorporated into the life of God. So we've been given a special dignity to participate in that life and a special identity as sons and daughters of God. A special grace has been given to us that changes everything. We've been given a particular identity, a vocation and a mission that affects and changes everything in our lives. From how we conduct our scientific research, to how we use technology, to how we relate to others, to how we manage our laboratories and our, and our workplace. And in speaking about our activity in the world, Guy Dimitzfez suggests three criteria for judging human activity. So Guy Dimitzfez says that when you're kind of judging how good your activity is, you can ask these questions. Is it in accord with a divine plan and will? Does it harmonize with the genuine good of the human race? Does it allow men and women as individuals and members of a society to pursue their total vocation and fulfill it? I think these are excellent questions for reflection. They're excellent questions to ask ourselves as we think about why we're here, what we're doing, and where we're going. And I just want to speak a bit more about, about, these, about these questions. So the first, and I think it's an excellent sort of examination of conscience about life in general. Um, but the first, the first thing is about this prime and fundamental vocation. And it's a prime, and a prime and fundamental vocation of every baptized Christian is the call to holiness. Okay, we're called to be holy. And it's a really important point. It's really easy for us to overlook. Being holy isn't just about going to church on Sunday, or attending prayer group, or giving the occasional bit of money to charity. No, it's something much, much deeper than that. We've been clothed in Christ and refreshed by the Spirit. And with St. Paul, we can say, it's no longer I who live, but Christ who lives in me. And I'm incorporated into the Trinity. My life suddenly takes on a new meaning, a deeper meaning. And Guy Dimitris tells us that Whoever follows after Christ becomes the perfect man or woman because Jesus Christ is the example of what it means to be fully human. He was the one that was the exemplar of what it is to live a fully human and, and flourishing life. So our whole lives, you know, to be fully human, our lives should be conformed to the life of Christ. And we become more fully human and more fully ourselves. Now, in a society, okay, like here, that wants to keep personal faith a private matter, like we do it behind closed doors on a Sunday, we don't bother people about it, we don't say happy Christmas, we say happy holidays, and we're really careful not to offend anybody, okay, because we don't want to do that. What I've just said can sound really shocking, even in, even in this context where you know you're coming to a talk on science and faith. It can seem really shocking to hear somebody stand up and say these things quite forcefully in a public setting and say that they're important. And that's because the Christian faith is a radical way of life. It's something, it's, it's life changing, it's transforming. I was prepared to stake my life, my academic life, on going to Lima. Like I thought that was a big risk. But you hear about Christians in the Middle East who are being persecuted for their faith, you hear about religious brothers and sisters who give up their lives for the poor. You know, we can all think of people like that who we've met, or if we haven't met them, we can think about, you know, Mother Teresa or any of these great figures, and in different Christian faiths too, that have really given their lives for Christ. That is an example of what the Christian faith is. So the point is that the the Christian faith is central to our lives. It's not something we can kind of leave on the side. It's something radical. It's something shocking. It's something scandalous. It's something they kill the early Christians for. It's something they kill the, you know, the Christians in the Middle East for. It's something that we are a bit embarrassed about in, you know, in dinner parties and formal settings. But if we don't understand the, the, the centralness and radicalness of our Christian vocation, we're never going to be able to talk about what it means to be a scientist who's Christian. 
So really, our scientific work is great, it's really important, but it only makes sense in the light of Christ. So it doesn't matter what grades we get, it doesn't matter, matter whether our lab works out or how many papers we publish in nature or science, or whether we publish in nature, then science, or what order, you know, or how many grants we get, or how many likes we get on Facebook, or whether we get a good review in a daily Pennsylvanian. If our careers and our lives are not ordered around the central truth that our fundamental vocation is to holiness and life in Christ, then everything else is meaningless. Our scientific work, our pursuit of truth, is a noble vocation. It's a gift from God. But it only makes sense if we see it in the broader context of our universal call to holiness. So once we understand that, once we understand the absolute primacy of the universal vocation to holiness, which you all have, you know, everyone, you know, it's something that people have. It's not just reserved to kind of special people or important people. It's something that Christ gives to all of us. But then we can go on to think about how does this call to holiness play out in our daily lives, in our life in the laboratory, our kind of, you know, at home teaching the kids, you know, helping the kids with their homework, helping out our neighbour, helping out with our different projects. How, does it, how, does, how do we understand that vocation in our daily lives? And Pius XII talks about this. He says that, you know, the Christian faithful, he uses the word laity, these ordinary Christian people, we are the ones who are kind of at the forefront. We're the kind of troops at the front line because we're the ones that deal with the world on a daily basis. We're not separated from the world by a monastery or a convent. We're there dealing with the everyday reality of life. And we have a duty to become experts in our field. So if God has entrusted to you the gift of being a biologist or a chemist or a physicist, you have a duty to do it well, to embrace it, to become an expert in your field, whatever that field may be, whether it's as a doctor or a dentist or any kind of profession that you have in your daily work, you're bringing the light of Christ to that area of the world. You're bringing the light of Christ to that area of, of the secular world that we live in. You should be good scientists, not half-hearted scientists. You shouldn't be a Christian scientist. The scientists are Christians. They're kind of like a bit loopy on the edge. No, the scientists are Christians. should be like, yeah, they're really experts in their field. We want to invite them to kind of give big, big talks and kind of physics and dark energy and all that kind of stuff. That's what we want. So the next question which uh, we had was, does our science and our work, does it harmonize with the genuine good of the human race? Now this is a huge question. So God created the world and he gave it to us. We're called to be in the world and to help to order worldly affairs in accordance with God's will. Work is something inherently um, part of the dignity of the human race. And John Paul II writes this letter called Laborum Exercens, and he tells us that man is made in the image of God, partly through the mandate received from his creator to subdue and dominate the earth. In carrying out this mandate, every human being reflects the very action of God, creator of the universe. So when we're carrying out our work, we're sharing in the work of God. God created and ordered the universe now, some people work in science and they're kind of, they're really manipulating the matter of the universe. They're, they're growing plants, they're manipulating cells, they're manipulating matter in a laboratory or in chemistry. And others of us, you know, in physics, we're probing the depths of the physical universe and studying it. And in those ways, we're sharing in the work of the creator who made this matter, who ordered this matter, who invites us to share in his creative work. And um, John Paul II goes on to talk about, you know, the universe has natural laws that are, that are, that are held at all places in all, in, in all ways. And we have a duty and a, and a sort of mandate to study those laws, to find out about the creation that God made for us. And it's interesting that, you know, as, science, as, a, as a cosmologist, we believe, by the way, I'm saying we believe because we don't know, we believe the universe is the same in all places and all directions. And that's called the cosmological principle. 
And that's something that all cosmologists, okay, more or less, 90%, fundamentally accept as an article of faith. You know, we think that, yes, physical laws are true, and they exist everywhere in the universe in the same way. That's why we're able to study them. That's why we're able to devote time and effort to doing experiments. And he also talks about how when we're carrying out this kind of research, we should make sure that our research is carried out in accordance with the moral norms. That's particularly important if you're doing biological research or research with, with, with humans, with people. And he goes on to say that nothing that we do in science, nothing in our study of the truth that we can find from studying the physical world can be in conflict with truths from our faith. Because God is the author both of physical truth and supernatural truth. So God's not going to put something contradictory in one side that doesn't agree with something on the other side. Both things work together. Whoever labors to penetrate the secrets of reality with a humble and steady mind, even though he is unaware of it, is nevertheless being led by the hand of God, who holds all things in existence and gives them their identity. Man is becoming aware that it is his responsibility to guide aright the forces which he unleashed and which can enslave him or minister to him. So it's a great privilege that we have to share in this work, and it's a great privilege that we are uncovering the secrets and the power of the universe. But we must do it in consideration with how this will affect other people and how it will be used. So the proper order of creation is for creation to be subject to humans through the process of work. And this topic of work and creation is a big theme of John Paul II. And he says that work is a good thing for man and it's a good thing for humanity because it transforms nature and it adapts to his needs. Okay, so we can adapt our environment to make it more hospitable. We can have this nice kind of room and it's air conditioned, then we can have light and, and somewhere comfortable to be. And the fact that we can adapt nature helps us to come, helps us to become more human. So as we adapt nature around us, we've got more time for the arts, we can make music and we can talk to our friends and we can enjoy food together. We're gradually, ad gradually adapting things around us to make, to make our surroundings more pleasant, to make our life better, to help us in our human flourishing. It helps us to become more human, not less human. But any kind of work that we do should be dignified. It should be a sharing in the creative work of God. It shouldn't be oppressive, dehumanizing, or degrading. And we can think of many examples in the realm of science and technology where sometimes the proper order is reversed. And we can think of really trivial examples like, oh, well, I'm always answering my work emails, even on a Sunday night, even when I'm at home with the kids, I'm kind of a slave to my cell phone, and I'm constantly checking it for messages. You've, you've become subject to your work rather than work being subject to you. And we can think of more dramatic examples about dangerous working environments in industrial plants or factories. But remembering that we're called to be leaven in the world, we can think about what we can do to promote the dignity of work, especially our scientific work, and how we can prevent it from becoming dehumanizing and oppressive. In fact, here in a college context, think about how do we treat our graduate students? I think you don't have graduate students here. But in general, how do you treat your lab technicians? How do you treat your early career scientists? I've been very fortunate to work with excellent colleagues. But I've certainly heard many stories of graduate students and postdocs being overworked, exploited. They don't take enough vacation. They're working in a laboratory the whole weekend. They're going home late on Christmas Eve. You know, how is the workload in our college departments? What are the expectations for tenure track and tenure faculty? Do we in the scientific community contribute to the culture of overwork? Do we expect staff and colleagues to work evenings and weekends, thereby harming family life? Has the blessing of work been transformed into the burden of toil? Because John Paul II says that toil is just as familiar to those in the intellectual world as it is to those in the kind of physical world. 
yeah, I can see some nodding over here from those who are toiling at the academic, the academic workbench. It's hard work, and you bear a big responsibility. And you have responsibility for decisions that will impact society greatly. So, this, this, so as I said, Gaudium at first talks about these huge kind of benefits that we have from an improvement in technology. I love that I can Skype my parents back in England and I can see them on Skype. For me, that's a great example of how technology is really helping me to flourish and be more human. But Gaudium at Spares also points to a tragedy. And it says that never has the, whilst never has the human race enjoyed such an abundance of wealth, resources and economic power, and yet a huge proportion of the world's citizens are still tormented by hunger and poverty. I mean, it's shocking. It's shocking to me that in this day and age, there are people living here in the Shandizans of Lima who do not have access to fresh drinking water, which is a basic human need. We're not even talking about healthcare or education. We're talking about having fresh water to drink. And in Laudate Si, over 50 years later, Pope Francis continues this theme, and he speaks at length about how the combination of technological advance and economic desires have done little to improve the conditions of the poor. Scientific advances can supply the material for human progress, but of themselves alone, they can never actually bring it about. Just because we have the technology, to split the atom, to have electric cars, doesn't mean that we're going to use it for good. So the, another document, Red and Thora Hominis, invites us to ask this fundamental question about our scientific work. Does this progress, which has man for its author and promoter, make human life more human in every aspect of that life? Does it make it more worthy of humans? And there can be no doubt that in various aspects it does. But the question keeps coming back with regard to what is most essential. Whether in the context of this progress, man as man is truly becoming better. That is to say, is he becoming, are we becoming more spiritually mature, more aware of our dignity, more responsible, more open to others, especially the neediest and the weakest? And are we readier to give aid to all? Progress in the spiritual life, you might think it's going to be marked by these kind of great ecstasies of Teresa of Avila or, you know, the visions of St. Faustina or reaching the seventh level of, you know, whatever. But actually, the true progress in the spiritual life is also marked by that increasing awareness of our own dignity as children of God and the dignity of every single person on this planet as children of God also, made in God's likeness and image and that we have this duty to care for those people. If we're saying all our prayers but neglecting the poor around us, there's something wrong. So what can we do to ensure that our scientific progress uh, is really being used to alleviate the poverty and the suffering of the neediest? So as scientists who are Christians, we've got a special calling, a special vocation, to ensure that science and scientific progress is used to promote human flourishing on all levels of society. So I would love it if we spent as much time and effort and money in looking at ways to solve these kind of problems in the shanty towns. You know, could we have an irrigation plant here? Could we have a saltwater desalination plant? Could we have solar panels? What kind of things can we do to improve the lot of people living in conditions like this? And living in conditions like this all over the world so we have the technology, and the question is, who is it that's going to be the person or the people or the group that talks about redirecting our scientific efforts to use our scientific progress to help human flourishing? So I'd just like to say a few words about, in the context of um, Yeah, sorry, in, in, individual vocations for each of us. 
So everyone's been given different gifts. God has blessed us with many, many abundant gifts and blessings in all different ways. And we can identify two kinds of gift. So the first are gifts that are for ourselves, for our personal sanctification, for our holiness, that help us to grow personally closer to God. And the second kind of gift is the gift which is given to you for the benefit of the whole community and the whole human race. The first kind of gift are things that we talk about, like gifts of the Holy Spirit, um, gifts that help us to love Jesus more, help us to participate, participate more deeply in the divine life. And the second kind of gifts are given to us as a whole community. And they're special charisms. For example, people are given um, special gifts, skills, and talents for science, technology, for engineering, for promoting science, for fundraising, okay, very important, for publicity, for spreading the word, for organizing people. And the question is, whatever gift or skill or talent you have, whether that's as a scientist or whether it's something different, how are you going to use that gift, skill, or talent to help human flourishing? You know, how are you going to live out your vocation? And how are you going to help others live out their vocation? So just to recap on this kind of question of vocation, just to recap on this thing about um, vocation as a scientist and a Christian. So the first thing is that our fundamental vocation is to holiness. So anything that we do should help us become more holy. And it should help us to help other people to also become fully human, okay, to recognize their vocations. Those of you who are in teaching professions will be able to understand this. You're going to help the people you're teaching or working with to realize their vocation. The second question, which I'm going to talk a bit, bit more about in a minute, is about the sense of awe of the universe. So what are, where do we look for those answers to the questions that rise within us. These answers about awe and wonder and destiny that I mentioned earlier. So part of our job as a scientist who are Christian is to help people to kind of reach those answers. The third thing is that the search for truth is a noble pursuit. There is absolute truth and it's a worthy pursuit. And whether you're studying the truth about the natural world, the truth in science, or the truth in theology, or the truth in philosophy, these are all worthy pursuits which are worthy of the dignity of human study. Fourthly, we're all made in the image and likeness of God, and we share in his creative work. Scientists, we have a special kind of share in that creative, creative work of God. And we have a duty of stewardship, of, of science and technology, and we have a duty to think about where are we going to direct this work? Where are we going to direct these advances? How are we going to use it? And how are we going to make sure that this knowledge that we've been given is shared by those who need it most? And also, we have a duty of evangelization. So nowadays, mission territory isn't some far away distant world. Okay, mission territory is our own universities, our own colleges, our own departments. And it can seem really frightening to say, oh yes, well actually, yeah, I'm, I'm a Christian and I'm gonna, you know, the reason I'm not gonna be there on Sunday morning is because I'm gonna go to church. Um, you know, don't be afraid. You have to be gentle, you have to be respectful, you have to always respect the other point of view of the person, but don't be afraid to admit who you truly are. For many years of my life, I was afraid of that. And I was afraid of saying, oh yes, well actually I'm Christian and I'm not gonna be around. But as John Paul II says, you know, do not be afraid. Um, I wanted to share a bit with you my kind of experiences, my story, so that you could see how, uh, how I overcame, overcame that fear. And really, the vocation that we all have about human flourishing is, is a great vocation to have because it means you're helping others to reach their true fulfillment also. So I'm looking at Kathy in a timer. And I think, do you have 10 minutes or are we, are we out of time? What time is it right now? Because I, yeah, we don't we don't know now. Yeah, I, I I thought we were getting pretty close. So, I'm. Uh, we've got five minutes. Yeah, great. So I just wanted to talk about a couple of things about our place in the universe. And I, I want to take you back to high school chemistry, which could be quite frightening for some of you. 
Luckily, I know we have a qualified chemist in the room somewhere who will help you with any hard questions afterwards. And just to talk about where, where we come from in the physical sense. So you remember this diagram? Here we're zooming in. And here you can see I've circled carbon, nitrogen, oxygen. OK, carbon and oxygen are very important for the human body. Carbon and oxygen are formed in the centers of stars like these. Okay? So every single atom of carbon in your body was at one point in the center of this star. And then the heavier elements, okay, these kind of heavy things, what we call metals, and all metals, these things here are all formed in, in supernovas, so calcium that you find in coral reefs, or iron that you find in your blood, or gold that you find in cold wedding rings and things. These are formed in the center of these supernova explosions. And then this is, these are the, the pillars of creation in the Eagle Nebula. So baby stars are born in these big clouds of dust. They're not empty space, they're cl dust clouds. And around these kind of infant baby stars, we have these kind of protoplanetary disks formed. And then eventually, we have planets formed. And in recent years, we have, we've heard lots in the news about these kind of new planets that were discovered. I remember it was in 1995, and I was still in school, that the first one was discovered. And probably you remember, you might have heard about the Trappist system recently, which has Earth-like planets. So now we're reaching, we're reaching the reality that we're finding lots of other planets out there. Just now, we don't really know, are there life in these other planets? Uh, is there intelligent life? Maybe we can have a whole seminar on that one day. Dr. Dushy, I think it'd be great. It'd be really interesting. We could write some good speakers. But these, these questions about other planets and looking back and seeing ourselves as the pale blue dot, you can ask yourself, well, does that mean that, that really planet Earth has no significance in the, in the universe? Are we just like one thing among many, many other things? And I just want to finish with a little thought, which is the reason that our planet is special, partly it's because we're here, that makes it special, but partly it's because it's where God entered into his creation also. So just, just think, you know, all these kind of elements that are made in these kind of explosions that go in to make our body, that go in to make the wheat, that make the bread, that go in to make the body of Christ, whether you think about Christ being incarnate 2,000 years ago when God walked among us, God entered into his creation, and God chose to enter his creation here on this planet. And if you do come from a Christian tradition, which you have this understanding of the Eucharist, then you understand also that God is physically present in, in the body and blood of Jesus, which you have at Holy Communion and church services. Sorry, I don't know why this has come out in a funny language. Um, it's come out in translation here. But just to offer you that thought, that the thing which sets us apart, that makes our pale blue dot special, is that we're here... We're made in God's image and likeness, and God entered here into creation. And the final takeaway thought is to remember that our life and our vocation only truly make sense in the light of Christ. All the science we do, all the things we achieve in life, ultimately they find their meaning in Christ. Thank you for listening. So thank you, Marissa. Uh, wonderful to see your integration. And especially, uh, I think what struck me too was that your experience in Lima has not left you, that you still uh, care about those who need uh, us the most. And that's wonderful to see in a scientist. What we do next is have a couple minutes talking to the folks at your table uh, about what you just heard, some questions you might have, and then uh, you might want to formulate a question. So in a few minutes, we won't uh, spend too much time, but uh, maybe five or 10 minutes, and then we'll have you, uh, anyone who wishes to ask a question can do that, okay? So take, uh, take time getting to know your neighbors and uh, 
uh, you know, talking about what you've just heard. Thank you. Nobody. Okay, there's a question. Okay, excuse me. Uh, we're struggling a little bit with uh, the concept of supernatural. And combined with that, we'd like to see what you say or what you think about why so many astronomers, astrophysicists, and so forth are atheists. Um, and I don't know whether they started out being atheists or whether they became atheists after they learned some of the things that they learned. Uh, but could you flesh that out a little bit for yeah, us? So let, me, let me try. So first of all, supernatural, okay, literally anything that's above nature. So anything that's natural, that's in the physical realm, things that are visible, measurable, observable, those things are all natural and physical, including things like the three dimensions of space, the dimension of time, the fourth dimension which space-time curves, curves into, if you go for string theory, the six dimensions plus the four extra dimensions, those things are all physical, they're all natural. Supernatural is above nature, the, the spiritual, things like God, for example, God is pure spirit. He's not physical. So God made creation, and when he made creation, he made time and space. But God doesn't, God isn't kind of part of time and space, and he's different from, you know, he's separate. So God is, God is an example of something that's real, but not physical. It's spiritual or supernatural. You could think of other kind of examples like human souls, okay, souls are different from the mind. You can think about, well, we've got this kind of human body and a brain and a mind and thoughts, which are all physical processes and physical things, but then above that is the soul or the supernatural part of ourselves, the immortal part of ourselves. The, um, I mean, in life in general, you can think of many things that are not physical and material. The second part of your question was about why so many people are in, in astrophysics are not believers. And I would say, first of all, if you look around, okay, in, in, in society, many people are pretty much agnostic about belief in God. I would say, apart from the people who are strong believers, most people who are not strong believers are pretty much agnostic, which means that they don't say strongly that God does or doesn't exist. It's actually very rare to find a true atheist who will say to you, I can prove to you that God doesn't exist. Most people take the opinion of, oh, I can't see any evidence for God, I think he doesn't exist, but they won't actually say, I firmly believe that God doesn't exist. There are very few people like that. So that's in society as, as a whole. I would say within physics, there are probably more people than you think that are believers they just don't always self-identify. There's a, a report by the, the, the Pew Research, Pew Research, what's it called? In two, 2009, which has a survey of religious belief among the population in general and among scientists. And what we see nowadays is that many people identify as spiritual but not religious. Okay, they didn't want to kind of like sign up to mainstream religion, but they still believe that there's kind of yeah, there's something more to life that I can't see. There's not, there's something more to life. So to answer your question, I think there are actually a lot of scientists who are believers of some description, and there are not so many that are atheists. But it is a, it is a good question. discussing um, it, like your point of view is from being a Christian um, but what about the other scientists who are of different faiths and how you interact with them and it would seem to me that some of these questions would be the same for any faith I mean do you share those kind of questions and 
the part two of my question, or our question is, like when you're discovering something um, as a scientist, you may not know what you're discovering or developing, what it actually is going to do for humanity. You know, it may have different consequences. Uh huh. So first part of the question about people from different faiths. So I would say it's really, you know, there, there's a strong sense of union between those of different faiths that I've met in physics. Like I, you know, I have friends who are perhaps um, Muslim, for example. I've got a few friends who are Muslim and a few friends who are Jewish. So they're not Christian faith. They don't have the same belief in Christ, but they believe in God and they believe that there's something more to life. And the thing which I share with them especially is that sense that the material world is not the only thing. And especially when we ask those questions about meaning and purpose, they also find that meaning and purpose lies outside of the purely physical realm. So that's like a really, really good meeting point. And something, you know, and even the practical things like we all want to go to our kind of faith services on a Sunday or a Saturday night or whenever it is, and we want time for our prayers and we're at conferences. And so we do, you know, there is solidarity in the practical reality of living out our faith and also in sharing those deep questions and where we think those answers lie. That is something beyond. The second part of your question, by the way, you should ask me one question and then get someone else to get the second question because I'm going to forget the second part of the question as time goes by. Oh yeah, we didn't know where it's going to go. Yeah. Like for example, we're going to discover how to split the atom and are we going to use it to build power stations or nuclear weapons? That kind of thing. Right. So my work is in dark energy. We're gradually uncovering the physical laws of the universe. And it's true. And especially, the kind of, I don't know where it's going to go. And the kind of research that I'm working on, we could stop, we could stop doing my research or this kind of level, it's basically researching to fundamental physics, and you wouldn't notice in five years or 10 years or 50 or 30 years, but in 50, 60 or 100 years time, you would suddenly notice that you're behind other countries that did do that research. I mean, for example, when Albert Einstein was working on general relativity, oh, well, it's some kind of abstract theory of geometry in the universe and space-time curvature, but actually the GPS in your cell phone wouldn't work if you didn't do corrections for general relativity. So if you're right, very often there's like a long time lag between finding out about the science and it having some kind of practical application. But no scientific knowledge is in itself inherently bad because the universe is inherently good. Like God made the universe and God made it good. Which is, you know, so if we study the universe and learn about science, we're learning good things. And the problem is, if we do wrong things with the good stuff we have, you know, you could have a car, and you could use the car to drive and get the groceries and get the kids from school, or you could use the car to run raid a store, or, I don't know, some other kind of bad purpose. So how you use it is a different question from having that knowledge in the first place. Uh, how do you respond to a guy like Lawrence Krauss, who was, apparently wants to be the Richard Dawkins of physics and cosmology? And I read recently where he said that, uh, you know, uh, why, que why questions are essentially meaningless to him and that they essentially can be reduced to how questions. No, I don't agree with that, but I'd like to hear your reaction to Lawrence Krauss's point of view that why questions are essentially meaningless to him as a materialist physicist. Okay, so I must confess I've not, I've not read Lawrence Krauss, so you have to kind of fill me in on any details as I answer the question. I would say to Lawrence Krauss, for example, I don't know if he's married, but 
you know, why do you want to get married? Why do you want to study physics? Why do you want to disprove God? Why do you want, to, why, why would you, if you don't believe in God, why would you devote your whole life to having a campaign to prove God doesn't exist? You know, I think these are important why questions that I think are meaningful in his life as well as other areas too. Does that help a little bit? A little bit, yeah. Forgive me, I, I don't know if I can formulate this correctly, but you know, you're working in the scientific realm, you're working with physical laws and everything else that uh, have applicability throughout the universe. And why don't we really believe more in moral laws that are just as valid as the physical laws, that we are living in a moral universe and these laws are extrapolable any place? Yeah, I completely agree with you. I completely agree that moral laws are universal, that they're something that, that apply at all places at all times. Totally with you on that. The question is, why do we think that? And the rest of the world doesn't always think that. And I think, I mean, this really comes down to the question of belief in general. And I personally think that one reason that people don't believe in, in, in God or in, about, in why questions or in moral laws is because they're so caught up in the busyness of their daily lives and they're so distracted that they very rarely stop and think. If you go on the bus or the subway or you're in the kind of line at the bank, everyone's kind of on a cell phone like doing this kind of stuff. Nobody really stands and thinks. They never really sort of think about, so why am I here and what should I do with my life? And they're so kind of distracted that they don't contemplate these deeper truths. And I think, I think, I think it's more than possible to sit and think and reason your way to the idea that yes, there are moral laws, universal moral laws, and that it's a truth. But most people haven't taken the time to do that study. Right on that, no, oh, another question. That's right, Joe, you said you wanted to do another one. I forgot. Uh, several times during your talk, you used the term fully human. Yes. Could you explain to me what you mean by that? Yeah, so you can talk about humans being animals. And sometimes I share a little slide from the telescope with a little fox that lives at the telescope. It's very cute. And I always talk about the fox, and I say, the fox is at the telescope. We're doing all this great science. The fox is really happy. You know, he goes about, he kind of raids the kitchen rubbish bin for the kind of scraps and he's very happy in his life okay he's fulfilled he's 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 got everything he needs but for us humans we need something more for to be fully human it's not enough for us to just have what the animals have it's not enough for us just to have food and water and shelter we need something else and to be fully human to be fully alive we need something more, and it's, it's almost intangible what that something more is. For example, I feel the need to look at the stars, and I look at the stars and think, wow, what's up there? The fox doesn't do that. Or I feel the need to have a kind of conversation with friends or other things, and that's, to me, that's human flourishing. And connected with this, it's, and again, going back to my experiences in Lima, I would be on the bus with people who are going to work in Lima, all packed in and crowded on these kind of very tiny buses that were falling apart and this kind of noise and chaos of Lima. And I looked at the faces of the people and I saw that there were people who were living incredibly hard lives. They were working in very difficult conditions. Often they were the domestic servants of the bigger houses or, you know, people who are oppressed by life, who are oppressed by work, who are oppressed by poverty. And when I looked in their faces, I knew that they weren't flourishing fully. I knew there was something missing in their lives. You know, they had food, shelter, and water. They had employment. But they needed more than that. There's something more about being human. To, to, to live your 
fully human life, you need to have that freedom of creativity, that freedom to experience love, that freedom to experience friendships, that freedom to dream, that freedom to look to the future, that freedom to look at the stars, that freedom to see beauty in the flowers or, or the faces of the kids. And that's what I mean by being fully human. There's something more. We're not just animals. To, um, to end, beautiful uh, thought. Thank you, uh, Marissa, for your uh, talk and for, your, and for being with us tonight. And I hope all of you will have a good trip home. I hope you don't have run into any difficulties. And don't forget to come back in April. Uh, what's the date? April 16th, I think. We'll, uh, we'll be talking about Darwin and evolution. And thanks to all of you, too. It's been great talking to you all. Nelson, we're there.